Knowledge is mentioned 162 times in the Bible. Knowledge begins in Genesis and it ends in Revelation. If he talks about something 162 times in only 66 books from Genesis to Revelations, I think he's talking about something I need to know about. Amen. That's just kind of the way I look at it. I have several scriptures I want to look at this morning, but the main scripture is going to be 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. And I love this scripture because I know that my God, hallelujah, is a God of multiplication. When the little boy brought him a couple of fish and a couple of loaves of bread, Jesus didn't give him back a couple of fish and loaves of bread and said, good luck, see what you can do, work it out. I mean, there's a lot of people here to be fed, but can't help you. No, you know what he said? He said, go feed the people, and he blessed it, and he multiplied it. Everybody shout multiply. I don't know about you, but I need some multiplication in my life, amen? I need multiplication of energy. I need multiplication of strength. I need multiplication of knowledge. I need multiplication of grace. I need multiplications of uh, finances. I need multiplication of time. Anybody with me? I mean, in the Bible, time stood still so that they could win a war. I don't know about you, but I want time to stand still because I'm getting older faster than I'm getting things done. I want to slow down a little bit. Amen? So 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 says, Grace and peace be multiplied. Oh, I know. Prescriptions are going up for anxiety. People say, I don't have any peace. Sleep medicines, prescriptions off the Richter scale. Because of lack of knowledge, my people perish. But in 2 Peter, in this first verse, or the first chapter, he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Okay, you want grace and multiplied? Grace and peace multiplied? Grace and peace multiplied? I do. Then what's it say we have to do? It comes through the knowledge of God. You know what? I don't think church should just be church. I think, I think it should be a university. Because most of us spend more time on the seat of a classroom than we do in the seat of a church. We spend more times in books and manuals and how-tos and Googles and YouTubes and you name it, MP3s, than we do in the Bible. Come on. I'm preaching good now, right? But through the knowledge of God and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The knowledge of God, the creator, and the knowledge of our Savior, our Redeemer, our Healer, Jesus, the, the, the triune God with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have to know God, and we have to know Jesus. When we know God, hallelujah, then we will come to know Jesus because we can only know God through Jesus, his Son. Correct? So few people understand how important knowledge can be. Knowledge allows you to drive a car instead of ride a horse. I'm all about that. Amen? It also helps us survive far longer than we should or could. Knowledge prevents us from making the same mistakes over and over and over again. Sometimes we have problems with knowledge because we have problems obtaining it and then keeping it. I want to give you a couple more scriptures. Proverbs 18:15. An intelligent heart acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. That tells me if I want to be wise, I've got to have the right kind of heart going after the knowledge that God wants me to have. If my heart's wrong, God's not going to reveal to me his knowledge. Because if my heart's wrong, I'm going to use that knowledge to pervert and to control, to manipulate, and to do wrong. Isn't it true? I'll give you a story here in a minute about that. Proverbs 1.7 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. So if I'm not wanting to have knowledge, and if I'm not wanting wisdom, then I'm being a fool. All right? Then I like the next one, Proverbs 2.10. For wisdom will come into your heart. So what, God, what does God care about? Our heart, right? Wisdom comes into our heart, and then knowledge becomes pleasant to our soul. So wisdom comes into our heart. God comes into our heart. God is wisdom. That spirit comes into our heart. And then our mind, will, and our emotions, which is our soul, becomes pleasant. Amen? Feels better. Has more peace. Accepts the grace of God. Proverbs fifteen fourteen: The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouth of the fool feeds only on folly. In other words, what are we eating? Because just like natural food, 
If I eat good food, I become strong, I become healthy, my mind fires. If I eat sugar, if I eat carbohydrates, I become sluggish, I become sleepy. It's the same world, same way in the world. If I eat only what I'm watching on TV, if I eat only what I'm hearing on the radio, only what stimulates me, satisfies me, makes me happy, I'm not going to be that strong Christian that's able to stand in the times that we're looking to go into. Amen? So let us never reduce God to our image. Let me say that again. Let's never reduce God to our image. Our puny righteousness, right? We will never obey the words of Peter and grow in the knowledge of God if we don't stay in the word of God. So if you're thinking, well, I don't really need to be in my word. Yes, you do, because the word of God needs to be in you. The word of God needs to be in me. This is the way to mature. This is the way to have an abundant life. This is the way to have a powerful Christian life and not be a puny Christian. It's kind of like what Sam was talking about this morning. If I put God in a box, then all I'm going to get is what's in the box. But if I realize that God is all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, he, he has created everything on the earth. And I just don't want to know about what he created, but I want to know the creator. Then we're talking a totally different game, right? So here's a history lesson. Columbus, Christopher Columbus, was on his fourth voyage in 1504. His ships were grounded at St. Anne's Bay in Jamaica. And the natives were revolting, and they refused to supply the Spaniards food. Now, you're going to find that on the History Channel, but when you really study it, the reason they didn't want to give him any more food is because some of his men had killed some of their men, all right? And it was because of a scalping, and it's a whole long story. But what you need to know is they were without food because the natives refused to feed them, and they're stuck, all right? There seemed to be no way of escaping the agonies of starvation, and Columbus was looking at the almanac. Now, how many in here look at an almanac? Two of you. All right. All right. And of course, it would be the farming people, right, that raise animals and, all right. But there seemed to be no way of escaping the, this starvation. And he's looking at the almanac, you know, and he's learning that there's going to be a total eclipse coming. Everybody say knowledge. All right. So on the evening it was due, he called the natives to assemble and he told them, unless they repented and helped them, that the gods were going to be very upset with them and the moon and the sun and the stars were going to go out and become dark and in that order. He pointed to the moon and it had already started getting dark. The natives were terrified. They begged Columbus, intercede for us. They started delivering food immediately. The disaster was averted. The darkness passed and nothing happened. And of course, the natives never revolted again. Here's an example of the power of knowledge. I'm not saying what he did with that knowledge was correct, but he did save his people on his ship, all right? Uh, but lying is never all right. But let me just say this, knowledge is power. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Knowledge is power, but who created knowledge? God. So if we don't know God and we don't know what God said, will we have knowledge? What will we have? Information. And information can fail you. Information can control you rather than you have the power with the information and the knowledge that you have. Because Columbus had knowledge and he understood the workings of God's creation, he was able to save his life and the lives of his men. Knowledge enabled him to dominate and manipulate the natives because the natives were ignorant. That doesn't mean stupid. That means unlearned. And they were superstitious. Listen to this quote. The weak are almost always weak because of ignorance or lack of knowledge. The strong are almost always strong because of superior knowledge. This is supported by scripture. It's supported by reason. It's supported by historians. It's, it's supported by experience. Do you remember in chapter 3 of 1 Kings, in verses 16 through 28, it tells the story, and I don't remember this part of the story. Remember the two women that each had a baby, 
and one woman rolled over in the middle of the night and killed her baby. She snuck into the other woman's bed, took her baby, and now they're in front of King Solomon, and they're saying, she took my baby, and she says, no, I didn't. She rolled over on it. I didn't realize that those two women were prostitutes. Do you remember that part of the story? Why I don't remember that, I don't know, because that really means something. That means that even if we, as the church, have prostituted everything that we have, have lied, have lived horrible lives, we can still go to the king, and the king will be just. Why? Because he has knowledge. He knows why you lie. He knows why you sleep around. He knows why you do what you do. And he still loves us. Because he knows what makes you tick. He knows what broke you. Because he made you. They saw the knowledge of King Solomon that he had gotten it from God and he was able to make right decisions. The knowledge he acquired, he was able to apply to decide right from wrong. See, this has given me mercy over the people of God because they don't have the knowledge of God and yet we're expecting them to do right. They can't do right if they don't know right. They can't make right decisions if they don't have the right knowledge. Would have those Indians fed Columbus had they known that he was manipulating them and that there was an almanac there that told him there was going to be a lunar eclipse that it had nothing to do with the gods? I don't think so. Knowledge is power because it leads to the discovery of the means of power. If you're really listening to this, you're going to hear something about what's going on in the United States of America. America is the strongest nation in the world because of its superior technological knowledge and because it's been able to tap the resources of power in God's creation. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God bless America. Only those nations that are also in possession of this knowledge are ever a challenge. In some nations, wood is still the primary fuel. I would say 21 years ago, maybe maybe a little bit longer, probably longer, I flew into Kenya. And it was my first trip flying into the continent of Africa. And as I came into Kenya, you know, like when you're flying into Florida, it looks like broken mirrors everywhere because everybody has a swimming pool. So when you're coming in, it just looks like broken glass. Well, I was used to flying into Florida and seeing broken glass. But when I was flying into Kenya, all I saw was smoke. And when we broke through the smoke, not the clouds, the smoke, all I saw was fire, like yellow, red fire. And I'm thinking, has there been an earthquake? Is there a volcanic eruption? Like, do we need to, like, pick this plane wing back up and let's keep going, you know? And we landed, and it smelt like wood. And I realized every single meal they cooked was on a fire. Every single... Uh, community had fires to keep animals away. Every single woman boiled water to wash her clothes on a fire. Every single man, when he brought an animal in, he would tan the hides and, and do all that on a fire. That's how they lived. I came home and turned on my thermostat. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. Right? I mean, everything I had smelled like smoke. But we had knowledge they didn't have. So we had a lifestyle they didn't have. Can I tell you something? Quit living like you don't have the knowledge of God. Oh, I can't afford that. He walks on the streets of gold. Well, my body's just getting old. No, he said you'll renew your strength. He said your eyes shall not grow dim, nor your strength be abated. Do you believe the truth? Either we do or we don't. Either we got it or we don't. Just recently I was arrested by uh, someone who's helping me, and I said, well, I want to live within my means, and I really don't want to, you know, go get something I can't afford. Something to that effect. And he said, oh, so we'd rather have people that don't believe in God driving the really nice cars and living in the really nice houses than the people that do believe in God and are practicing the things of God, but we don't have the faith to believe what we read. And it was kind of a wake-up call for me. I was thinking, my belief is exposed by the actions I take and by the thoughts I think. We usually talk about that backwards. But look at your life. 
Does it expose what you believe? And if so, what is it exposing? Is it exposing that you know God and the knowledge of God resides on the inside of you? And that you believe in creative miracles and that you can lay hands on the sick and they do recover and that the dead do rise and the crippled do walk and the blind do see? Or that I really need that stimulus check because I really don't think I'm going to make it to the end of the month because my money ran out. Just saying. Growth in knowledge leads to growth in power. Growth in knowledge leads to growth in power. The more I know God, the more that I can subdue my own self to not do wrong. Because I have the power over the flesh. Because when I grow in wisdom, I grow in knowledge, I grow in grace. Grace is God's ability to do through me what I can't do through myself. When I say, I just can't quit eating, or I just can't get off the couch, or, you know, whatever you're saying. It follows that growth in the knowledge of God should lead to greater power in the spiritual realm. We have a weak church because we don't know God. Amen? Come on, say, oh, me. Right? This is precisely what Peter and the whole Bible teaches. Paul longed to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Why? I got to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I got to know these both. Why? Because if I know him, I know what he did for me, then I'll believe that he's raised from the dead. And if he was raised from the dead, so can I be. So can my marriage be. So can America be. So can everything be. There's no stone that can't be rolled away. I don't care how stony the heart is, it can be rolled away. I don't care how backslid that prodigal is, that stone can be rolled away, and yet that child can come home. Amen? See, do I believe that when I raise up a child in the way that they should go, when they're old, they'll not depart from it? Do I believe it? Because, see, that knowledge will keep me in perfect peace because my mind is stayed on him. And I'm not going like, oh, oh I don't know when, and, and then I'm, I'm sicker than my kid. My kid's on drugs, but so am I, but just mine are okay because mine are prescription. Ooh, she's preaching hot. And the knowledge of God... And of Christ is a power to be and to become all that you're called to be and to become. It's within the power of Christ, not your networking. I know that's great. Uh, It's not who you know, what you know. Mm, Not true. Just because we say it enough doesn't mean it's true. It It really does matter who you know. And it also matters who knows you. Amen? Peter says in in, uh, that verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. Grace and peace, God's ability to do through me. Yes, I can say no to that. Yes, I can live free of sin. Yes, I can live free of compromise. Why? Because I've got the knowledge of God and it's multiplied inside of me and it's giving me the grace to do what I can't do by myself. Growing in grace and peace is a matter of knowing God better. If you, if you say, I can't do it, I can't believe it, I can't see it, get to know God. If you say, you know what, I just think that's too hard. You know, I just think that God wants me to be comfortable. I just, I just can't tell my flesh no. I just can't do without that. Well, you know what, you need to have your butt on the seat in the church, and that's the university you need to go to for a while, and get out of everything else you've got your seat on, you're sitting on. Amen? This is what needs to come back to the church, because the church is never going to have power unless they know God. And the world is getting more powerful. And America, I dare to say, is not as powerful as you think she is. She shared too much of her knowledge. In verse 5, knowledge is one of the things that we're to diligently add to our faith. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Then in verse 8, the goal of all is from the negative side that we shall not be unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren. Hey! Barren in the body, barren in the job, barren in what you're doing all day long. Come on. Nobody wants to go to the grave broke. Nobody wants to go to the grave having not fulfilled who they're to be and what they're to become and what they're to do. Am I telling the truth? Okay. Neither shall they be barren or unfruitful 
Why not unfruitful? Because people can't taste and see that the Lord is good if we're not fruitful. If we're not producing fruit in our life, then can anybody taste and see that God is good? And isn't it so that the goodness of God is what leads a man to repentance? And if they can't see the goodness of God in you and you're poor and you're, you're driving a junk car and you're living in a junk house, boy, I want to serve that God. But if you're living right and you're being faithful to your spouse and you're raising your kids and they're sitting around your table like an olive tree and they're producing and you're driving a nice car and you're living in a nice house and your body looks right and you're not sick and you're not on prescriptions. I go to the doctors and they say, bring a list of your prescriptions. I come in, they go, where's your list of prescriptions? I said, I'm sorry, I'm not on any. And they go, what, you're not on any? And I said, no. They go, you're not on high blood pressure medicine. I said, no, I'm not. You're not on high cholesterol. On no, I'm not. You're not on diabetes. No, I'm not. Or you have a heart pill, water pill. No. I have no prescriptions. They don't believe me. Just a minute, we'll be right back. I swear they run a, they run a thing on me, and they come back, and they go, like, who are you? Where are you from, right? I'm from heaven. I'm an ambassador here. I don't live here. I sojourn here. I'm on a journey, and I'm going home one of these days, and I'm going home not sick. I'll fly away. Amen? Hallelujah. If we had nothing but 2 Peter, we could say the knowledge of God is the power of God. And that means all of his benefits and all of his promises belong to me because I'm a child of God and I know whose I am and I know who he is and I know he's a creator of all things. He even created the dirt he made me out of. Right? Worldly wise, no knowledge is power. Ask anybody. Ask Bill Gates. Ask Steve Jobs. Ask them if knowledge is power. It's so powerful, you all carry around an apple in your pocket. And you believe that Genesis says she ate a bite of the apple. And it doesn't say apple at all. So I don't think Steve Jobs really had it all together in all of his knowledge. Because he thought that was in the Bible. That's why he put that apple on there. Read his biography. Yeah. And it says she ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, of the fruit of good and evil. It doesn't say anywhere apple. See, I love shaking sacred cows. It didn't say anywhere that Paul was knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus, does it? No, it says that he had an encounter with God and he was blinded. But somehow we add horse. It's like what Jimmy talked about. We just finished that circle, right? If you missed that sermon, said Jimmy was preaching the house down. The success of science in demonstrating the power of knowledge has led to knowledge being the panacea for all of our problems and the cure for all of our diseases. Knowledge is the modern Messiah, which will bear our burdens and heal your diseases. However, salvation through science is the only hope that millions will even consider today. And it's not true. Tragedy is that they have the right answer, but they have the wrong object. Knowledge is the answer, but not the knowledge of creation, but the knowledge of the creator. Modern man is making the same foolish mistake that wise men made years ago. Romans 1 says that they had the revelation of God, and they could have chosen him, but in their wisdom, they became fools and they chose the impersonal handiwork of God and ignored the personal love and purpose of God. See, God loves you personally. You're God's handiwork. You're God's art piece. You're his creation. You're his child. You're his bride. Do you realize all the, the uh, titles that he gives to you because he loves you? And we think he doesn't care about anything except what's in the box. And he cares about everything, and he wants us out of the box. Man has become an, an expert on disease, but ignoring the cure completely. He has the right idea that knowledge is powerful, but blind to the highest, most necessary kind of power that man needs, which is spiritual power. He neglects the knowledge of God for the knowledge of man. Modern man in general have a thirst for knowledge of everything, except what they need most, they neglect most. If everybody could get God, that would be enough. They're like Mark Twain when he received an invitation to dine with the emperor of Germany. His little daughter said to him innocently, Daddy, soon you'll know everybody except God. 
And see, we've all been invited to dine at the master's table. He says that he goes before us to prepare a table for us. There is an invitation waiting for you. But we have to choose to live here a life that pleases God to be at that table. This is the judgment on modern man. He's anxious to know everything and everyone but God. Can you connect me with him? Can you connect me with them? Can you get me in with them? God's being pushed out of the curriculum of our colleges. There are too many supposedly more realistic, practical things to, sub, to study. The feeling is that we cannot be known according to scientific methods. Then if, it, if we cannot be known by scientific methods, it doesn't exist. It's superstition. It's just some good story. In fact, I tried to share the gospel with someone once, and you know what they said? That's a nice story for people that are not educated because it gives them peace. I'm saying, you're half right. It does give me peace, right? See, science alone is like a medicine chest that this person wrote about. Is my finger bleeding cut nearly off? In my medicine chest, there's a cure for cough. Is a tooth is shooting pains out in every direction. Here's something good for a nail infection. I have poison ivy and need for a lotion. Well, here, an unused seasick potion. Do you ever notice everything that the world gives you always gives you a side effect? Everything the world gives you always gives you something else that now you have to take something else to fix the something else? It's the world's medicine chest. But can I tell you, the creator knows how to create you so that you don't need in that anything like that. This is the weakness of science when it comes to the issue of the sin problem, which keeps individuals and the world in the same miserable mess in spite of scientific success. Physical power is not enough, for we need physical power, and this can only be found in the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. Listen, how is it that the men of old outran chariots? because they knew God. God was able to get them to believe. Everybody say believe. That the knowledge of God is higher than the knowledge of man and that you can do things that you don't think you can do because greater is he that lives in you than he that lives in the world.